These videos are a series of uh, films that I'm going to put together to relate uh, the history of AC Comics. Some readers have written in that um, I should include Paragon publications because AC Comics grew out of Paragon, which I uh, first formed in 1969. I could give you a nuts and bolts version of uh, how Paragon was put together and what we did over uh, the decade of the 1970s. But considering my career, I also have given thought for the first time in my life as to why I created Paragon and why I did those publications which led to AC Comics and ultimately uh, formed a career that has uh, lasted over 50 years. Uh, so I, I think I've come up with a couple of uh, ideas of why my life turned out the way it did. Um, they say that uh, most of your uh, concepts or um, ideals are formed in your early years, like when you're around six, seven, or eight. Uh, so uh, I look back at uh, what my environment was and uh, what my situation was around 1949, 1950. I was born in uh, Trenton, Pennsylvania, which was a little steel town on the Allegheny River located about 20 miles east of Pittsburgh. Uh, Tarentum was a nice little town. It was a steel town. The main uh, business of the city was the Allegheny Ludlam Steel Works. Uh, much of the uh, population of the town was employed by that company, including my father, John. Um, he was um, in World War II he served with uh, General George S. Patton, and it is said that he was one of Patton's hand-picked men. Uh, he was reticent about talking about what happened in World War II, as most vets of the greatest generation are. Uh, so I don't know too much about what he did. He was in the Tank Destroyer Corps, which is exciting. Uh, and I know that he was presented the Croix de Guerre and it was pinned on him by uh, nobody other than uh, General Charles de Gaulle himself. So uh, he did good service to his country. Um, I was born while he was still in the army, so I didn't see my father for the first couple years of my life. My mother, Gail, uh, was a talented artist. Uh, she uh, loved to draw and uh, was proficient at doing uh, uh, portraits and she loved to draw animals, cats and dogs and uh, things like that. Um, her father, Edward, Edward Wolf, uh, also was talented in uh, woodworking and his son, uh, my uncle Ed, followed suit with that and he, he made a lot of uh, clever things uh, in, in woodworking including he built me my uh, painting easel and not just a little one, he painted, he, he made this seven foot tall easel because I, I like to do big canvases and it, it accommodated them and that was amazing that he built this thing completely all on his own. And his son, Ed Jr., uh, one year my junior, uh, was a outdoorsman. He really loves the outdoors and uh, he became a, a veterinarian and an artist in his own right. He is very talented. Uh, he, he does uh, wildlife drawings and paintings uh, of uh, uh, wolves and bears uh, and nature subjects. He's quite good. So that's where my artistic background came from the wolf side of, of my family. Uh, and as I think about it, my environment was what really formed my uh, <clears throat> mindset for the rest of my life. Uh, Tram, Pennsylvania, uh, was nestled on the Allegheny River. It was a small town, like I said. Uh, everybody knew everybody else in the town, and it was quite friendly. My father was a very gregarious man. He loved people, and people loved him, and he knew most everybody. Uh, he, uh, I don't know what he did at Allegheny Ludlam, but I know he worked in, in, in the office. 
Um, my cousin Kathy's father, Dean Stump, was the company control controller, and uh, one of my dad's best friends was uh, Bob Hammond, who was the vice president of the company. So everybody was intertwined in Trenum. Um, Trenum started at at the uh, where it was flat along the Allegheny River, and this, this town was built on the side of a hill. And um, First Avenue was along the river. About Third and Fourth Avenue was like the center of town, where railroad tracks ran right through the middle of town. Uh, and then going up the hill, uh, the main road to the top of the hill was Corbett Street, and it went to, up from First Avenue to Tenth Avenue. And uh, the house that my dad got after he got out of the war was located at 913 Porter Street, which was halfway between 9th Avenue and 10th Avenue. It was on the corner of Porter and School Alley, and it was called School Alley because uh, you go down the alley to the next street over Corbett, go down a block, and there's the elementary school, and that's where I went to school. And uh, different world then, I. Uh, routinely walked to and from school as a six-year-old in 1949, uh, not accompanied by any adult or anything. Uh, my cousin Patty, who was five years my senior, uh, watched out for me, uh, sometimes accompanying me to the movies and, you know, watching me uh, at the playground, things like that. So I, I appreciate that. There, there were four things in my life that uh, really formed the person I became. Uh, the first one would be uh, radio drama, which uh, unfortunately doesn't exist today. Oh, no. You can imagine uh, television without the picture, only better because uh, radio dramas, uh, uh, they were half hour uh, stories uh, told orally. So you had to use your mind, your imagination to picture what was going on in the story. and that. Uh, I, I think was a major component to, to why I have a good imagination because I listened to the radio all the time. We had a radio in the living room and the family would sit around and listen to it, but I also had a radio in my own room and I would listen to the afternoon shows, uh, Lone Ranger, which was on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and on the same time slot on uh, Tuesday and Thursday was the Green Hornet, two masked uh, Men of Justice, uh, which you know were my heroes at the time. Uh, also, uh, Straight Arrow, the Indian uh, warrior, was also a dual identity character. Uh, so, uh, I, I really learned a lot about drama and storytelling from listening to the radio. Uh, the other uh, things that form my uh, composition as a as a as a person were comic books, uh, the movies, and television. Uh, television uh, was just new in 1949, but I was very lucky that the first television station in America was KDKA out of Pittsburgh. So we had access to television probably before other parts of the country did. My family did not have a television set in the house, but uh, I uh, appealed to the goodwill of my neighbors who allowed me to come into their house. I was a well-behaved, quiet boy, and I was able to uh, go across the street to watch Wild Bill Hickok, or maybe even later Captain Video. A uh, range rider I watched at another neighbor's house down the street. Uh, so I did get to see television, and uh, that was an amazing thing to me. Um, comic books, of course, played the, the most major part in my life. Uh, my neighborhood, uh, Trenum, all the houses were close together. There were lots of kids my age, and we all got together, and we'd go to the movies on Saturday, and we all had comic books. I don't know of a family in Trenum that I ever visited that there weren't comic books in the house. Uh, uh, if it was a girl child or boy child or, or no children at all, everybody seemed to have comic books to some degree. And all of us kids, and there was a group of us, like maybe five or ten of us that would get together, and we would trade comics, and everybody would uh, go to the circuit, and they'd, they'd take a stack of comics and go from house to house, and, hey, what do you got? Here's what I got, and all that. And so uh, my favorite comic book uh, in that era, 1949, 1950, was All-Star Comics, which uh, featured the first superhero team, the Justice Society of America. 
This is where I uh, was introduced to Green Lantern, The Flash, Hawkman, The Atom, Dr. Midnight, and Black Canary. Wonder Woman was in there too. Uh, but by trading comic books, I, I got to see earlier editions of All-Star, like from the mid-40s, because in 1950, the mid-40s was only five years in the past. So I would get, I acquired two or three of these big 68 page larger than normal size comic books uh, and so I got to uh, see the Spectre, Doctor Fate and Starman, uh, characters that uh, didn't exist in 1950. So I had a sense of history here that there were characters in the past that did not exist in the present. Uh, and that interested me and, and intrigued me. There, there was also a grocery store chain, um, Isley's, I believe, that uh, had spinner racks of comic books that were not the current comic books that were like a couple years old. They were never uh, sold and they weren't remaindered. And uh, they had uh, in the racks some of these big 68-page books and 52-page books that were going out of, out of existence by 1950. And it had titles like uh, Wiz Comics and uh, Captain Marvel and Master and uh, Black Hawk. Uh, so uh, these are the things that I, I collected. And um, going to the movies uh, was a ritual that uh, I pursued every weekend of my life, probably up until the time I got married. I went to the movies every Saturday. And in 1949, uh, a bunch of us kids would get together, again, no adult supervision. we cut through the alley to Corbett Street, go down Corbett Street, and like only four blocks away was the Harris Theater, where we would see Roy Rogers and the Bowery Boys uh, or we could go further on downtown uh, to uh, the main drag by the railroad tracks. There were two other theaters, the Manos, and another theater w whose name I can't remember, but that's where I spent most of my time. That's where I saw my first serial, The Ghost of Zorro, and I was totally shocked to see at the end of the film, Zorro died. I didn't understand the concept, but next week when I went back, I saw that he miraculously survived and went on to have several more weeks of adventures. But uh, one day in, in 1949, uh, something happened at that theater that changed my future life and uh, set me on a course that uh, led me to where I am today. Uh, I normally very much enjoyed the advent Western adventures of Tim Holton, the Rocky Lane, and uh, Rex Allen, Monty Hill. Uh, but that day, I, I saw something I had never seen before, and it really amazed me. Uh, Charles Sterrett was, a, was an actor uh, who uh, started in films around 1930, and he was one of the original uh, formers of the Screen Actors Guild. His guild number was, was 10. Uh, he, along with Boris Karloff and several others, formed the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, by 1949, he had... Uh, become entrenched in uh, the Western genre, starting in, <clears throat> in 1935, he made something like over 140 Westerns, of which he was top billed. Uh, he played mostly a character known as the Durango Kid. Uh, Durango was uh, a mysterious character who uh, came into play when uh, the sheriff or the marshal uh, couldn't get the job done and you needed to have something extra special done that may be outside the boundaries of uh, the law. He dressed in black and had a black mask that was not a bantana, it was a custom made mask, it was very sharp, came to a point, looked really neat. And uh, Starrett's eyes behind the mask, you know, uh, boy, they were, they were terrific. Uh, he was a very forceful figure and he was uh, very fortunate to have a uh, young Jock Mahoney, who was about his same size, uh, double him in the action scenes, and the Durango Kid was just full of action, leaping off um, tall, the tops of buildings onto wagons and going through the town and tumbling off the wagon, doing a roll and jumping up on his horse and riding, riding off. He'd always turn back around and go through town, blazing away. Uh, so uh, when I first saw this, I, oh, wow, <laughs> this was great. So uh, I, I left the theater that day very stoked 
And uh, usually, usually what we did on Saturdays was uh, my mother knew I went to the show. She didn't accompany me, but she went to my Uncle Bill's storefront, uh, it stayed at his store, which was fronted on the main uh, street in, in uh, Trenum. He wasn't my uncle, he was my father's uncle, but uh, I always called him Uncle Bill. He's why I was named Bill. Uh, I was named after my uncle. So I would uh, go to the store to meet my mother and then she and I would walk home again up the hill. Uh, well, between the theater and Uncle Bill's store was a newsstand, Snyder's newsstand. And I would always go in there and see what the latest comics were. And they had a, a great array of comics that was terrific. Well, this day, after seeing the Durango Kid, I was oh, astounded a second time by finding a Durango Kid comic book. So all these things, these four elements that, that shaped my life, well, they're all intertwined. The Durango Kid was in the movies. He was also in the comic books. And as you know, a lot of comic uh, books were made into movies and TV series. TV series were made into movies. Radio shows were made into movies. Everything was, was interconnected. So uh, I was very excited to find the Drango Kid comic, uh, but I didn't have another dime. So I went to Uncle Bill's store and cajoled my mother into forking out another dime, and I went back and bought the Drango Kid comic. Now this is important because uh, this comic book that I bought that day uh, set a time frame. At that time, I was already c collecting comic books, and I, I know now uh, because on the cover of the uh, the book it was uh, Durango on Raider, his white stallion. The only the first five issues of the comic book had photo covers, and that cover was the second issue, which was dated 1949. So by 1949, I already had a sizable collection of comic books. Also, uh, a, a good year in that. Um, I also saw the Lone Ranger. I knew what he looked like from the comic books, but the Lone Ranger TV series started in 1949. And like I said before, the Zorro serial, Ghost of Zorro, started in 1949. Clayton Moore, I didn't know at the time, also played both the Lone Ranger and, and Zorro in that serial. Uh, Zorro and, and the Drango Kid uh, served to really shape my imagination and my interest in dual identity characters and uh, that type of storytelling uh, all the rest of my life. Uh, and the environment that I had there in Trenum was really nice because uh, I could leave my house, walk down to Ninth Avenue and go down three blocks, three or four blocks. And there was a corner drugstore that had comic books. The comic books were that easy to get. And then I've already mentioned the, the newsstand downtown which had a, a great array of everything. Uh, so. I had radio, I had TV, I had movies, I had comic books. I had a lot of friends, as did my father, and uh, everything was perfect. Uh, I mean, to, to my mind, uh, Trenum was an ideal town to grow up in, particularly in the years 1948, 49, and 1950. Unfortunately, and very tragically, my mother had developed rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, my uh, fraternal grandmother had already relocated to Winter Park, Florida, as did my father's sister, Gretchen. And so uh, everybody got together and sort of formulated a plan that um, we should move to Florida uh, because Florida was flat. Uh, there weren't any Corbett Street Hills that had to be traversed. and. The house we had uh, was two-story, and my mother had to go up and down a flight of stairs to go to the restroom, or to the bedrooms are upstairs, and down a flight of stairs to the cellar to do uh, the laundry, because that's where the washing machine was, and so on. And so to ease her pain, uh, my father decided to, to uh, essentially sacrifice the life that he had, that he enjoyed so much, uh, to relocate to Florida where uh, I knew my grandmother and my step-grandfather and my aunt and my father and mother knew nobody else. We knew nothing of Winter Park. We'd visited it a couple of times and thought it was wonderful. But uh, it was uh, isolated, the, the, the area that they lived uh, from the, the main part of town. It was like a mile and a half. Uh, 
my father bought a lot and had a house constructed and uh, it was on Hollywood Avenue and Hollywood Avenue also foretells my future. Uh, my grandmother's house was on the far end of uh, Hollywood, uh, Hollywood Avenue and our new house was at the opposite end. In the middle was my Aunt Gretchen's house. Uh, across the street from the end of the house where we lived was an empty field. Nothing there. Across the street was the woods. The house itself was built in an orange grove. Backyard was an orange grove. Side yard was an orange grove. There was nothing in an orange grove between our house and my aunt's house. From my aunt's house to my grandmother's house, it was woods. There were only two other boys in the general couple block area of my age. And there wasn't any other boy my age within a half mile radius of my house. So uh, my mother and I went to Florida a couple months before my father. He stayed up there to finish the sale of the house and uh, make sure all the furniture was loaded and the movers had everything in order to, to, to uh, transplant our, our goods to Florida. And uh, what I didn't know at the time, and this was very traumatic, uh, was that he had made the decision not to include my comic book collection in what was to be moved to Florida. Um, in those days, uh, children were to be seen and not heard, and uh, there were no child rights like exist today. So um, my father, who was a, a nice guy, he, he wasn't mean or anything, but he never even thought to ask me if I wanted my comic books because to adults, comic books were, you know, silly. What, what use would they be, you know? So uh, he ended up giving them to uh, the veterans hospital so that they could be enjoyed by other kids, which, which was, a, was a nice thing to do. But had I known that I would not be able to have my comic books in Florida, when I made the trip down, which was a day and a half car drive, I would have pulled my All-Stars and my Durangos and clutched them to my bosom, and I would have held them for the whole day and a half, protected them, you know, to get them down there. But I, I was oblivious to what was going on. And so uh, once realizing this, suddenly... Gone was the Green Lantern, gone was the Flash, Hawkman, Dr. Midnight, gone was the Black Rider. Another thing that happened in 1951 that confused me, relocated in Florida, was that uh, Marvel Comics uh, imploded. And suddenly there was no Black Rider, no Texas Kid, and no Kid Colt. And uh, so up in Pennsylvania, I had the Black Rider, down in Florida, no Black Rider. And further complicating matters, uh, they changed artists on the Durango Kid. Uh, Joe Serta and um, John Belfi were the artists on uh, Durango up in Pennsylvania, but down in Florida, it was drawn by Fred Gardner. Of course, the editor just made a change in artists and it had nothing to do with my relocation, but to an eight-year-old kid, <laughs> I, I just was so unhappy with Florida, I just blamed everything on the move. <laughs> One, 1951 w was a horrible year <laughs> because other things happened that I didn't understand that l led me to believe that uh, the gods were conspiring against me. Uh, DC Comics canceled All-Star Comics in 1951. So up in Trenum, I had the Justice Society. Down in Florida, I didn't. And I was a mile and a half from any place to buy a comic book. There were no stores or anything around where we lived. And I had no way to get to the, to the store to buy comic books. Uh, the, uh, the school I went to, I got to by bus. It was on Park Avenue. Caddy Corner from the school was the one and only theater in Winter Park, the colony. They did have Saturday matinees, but it was a while before I could get to that. Uh, on down Park Avenue, several more blocks, was the, the newsstand uh, known as the Chocolate Shop. I never knew why it was called that. I don't remember much candy being sold there, but boy, it had every conceivable periodical, magazines, pulps, every comic book you could imagine. It was great. It was like the southern version of Snyder's newsstand, and I was thankful for that. But I had no way to get to these places until at one time, I don't know what year, my dad uh, bought me a Schwinn bicycle, 
And then I could go into town and uh, uh, once again started up my Saturday ritual of, of going to uh, the movies and then the, the newsstand. Uh, the Colony Theater did have Saturday matinees and it, sometimes it had serials, but it, it, it never advertised what was being played, not in the newspapers, and it never put up posters. So you had potluck. You went in and sat in the seat, and when the movie came on, it might be Johnny Mac Brown, or it might be Rocky Lane, or it might be Jungle Jim or Tarzan. You, know, you never knew what it was going to be. I didn't like that aspect of it because, you know, I, I was really in the uh, movie posters. I can remember vividly standing in front of the Harris Theater in Trenum, uh, looking up at this awesome poster on the side of the building in the front of the theater. It was for a movie called The Trail of Robin Hood. It was a Roy Rogers film. I always loved Roy Rogers. But also in this movie, it had Rocky Lane, Rex Allen, and Monty Hale. It was like the Justice Society of movie cowboys. I mean, I couldn't believe all these guys were together in one movie. So that, that was a memory vivid in my mind. Today, it remains one of my favorite movies. Uh, so anyways, um, in Florida, it, it was much more difficult. And uh, all the things that inspired my imagination were, were kind of gone and, and gone forever. Uh, so uh, I guess it wasn't until 1955 when I guess I probably was in the sixth grade that I found another guy who was in the comic books and was also into art. His name was Bobby Hunkapiller, and he was from Louisiana, and he started drawing his own amateur comic books in our break periods in the class. And because he was from Louisiana, his uh, company name for his homemade comic books was L.A. Comics, like D.C. Comics had Superman and Batman. So me being from Pennsylvania, I started my own comics, and I called it P.A. Comics, with a little P.A. up in the, in the upper left-hand corner. So uh, this started me drawing, and uh, we had kind of a competition, and I, the first comic book that I uh, had was called Startling Comics. Um, once I had my bicycle, I was able to not only go into Winter Park, I could leave the bicycle in the park bike rack, take a bus to downtown Orlando where I had access to all the theaters that did have posters and I knew from the newspaper there was a Drago kid playing at the Rialto so I would go to see that. Uh, also uh, there was a, a store called McVickers which was a bookstore which had a big uh, used bookstore selection which included comic books and I had found comic books which I now know were from the golden age of comics and one of those was a uh, a uh, comic published, it was a funny animal comic published by Nidor, uh, later called Standard Comics. And the reason I bought it was not for the stories, but the inside cover, it had a cartoon display of all the other titles that they did. And uh, there were two superheroes in this group, uh, the Black Terror and the Fighting Yank. And there were several titles, uh, thrilling, exciting, and startling. And somehow that startling title appealed to me. So my first homegrown comic book was called Startling. It featured three characters. This also is a window into my future. Uh, in my trips downtown Orlando to the Rialto, um, they had serials there and they had a serial called The Secret Code which uh, was a 1942 serial that had been re-released in 1952. It starred Paul Kelly, and he played a dual identity crime fighter called the Black Commando. Wow, he was great. Great outfit, good actor, and he got to duke it out with Nazis every week. So the first comic book character I ever drew was the Black Commando based on the movie. Again, the interrelationship between movies and comics and in my brain. Uh, the second feature in Startling Comics was Airwave. Airwave was a Golden Age character that appeared in DC's Detective Comics as a backup feature to Batman. Why I remembered him and why I chose to draw him, draw him I, I, I can't have any explanation for, but I did. Uh, the third character in the book was called the Blue Eagle, and he was totally uh, an original creation. So in this one title, you had a movie-connected character, a Golden Age homage, and an original character. And these three things 
formed the basis of, of my future career. Um, I also started at, at that age. <laughs> I, I, I expanded my PA Comics company. I did a couple of issues of Startling Comics. I also spun off the Black Commando into his own comic book. He ran three or four issues. Airwave got his own title for a couple of issues. And I did other titles like Adventure Trails where I had other characters that I created. Um, and um, I also did more characters based on uh, movies. And uh, like uh, I did a Zorro comic. Uh, I did a Buck Rogers comic based on the newspaper strip Buck Rogers uh, and so on. So even at that early age, I wasn't thinking about just doing one thing, but multiple titles. And I was in my mind creating an, an imaginary comic book company. Uh, and the way I, I oh, my drawings were terrible. I was, I was absolutely horrible, as you can see from these examples. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing, so uh, I would copy comic books and trace comic books. And uh, this helped me learn how to draw. Um, I, um, I knew comic books were printed on newsprint. So I drew my comic books on newsprint. I went to the, the, the dime store in downtown Winter Park and uh, found packs of paper, which were called second sheets. Back in the old days, there were things called typewriters, and you put a sheet of paper in it, and you, you typed on it. And if you wanted to make a copy of that, you had to have a, a carbon sheet of carbon paper that you put under your original piece of paper, and then you put a second sheet under that, so that when you typed, it would make a carbon copy of what you were doing. Second sheets were customarily made out of newsprint. So even though, of course, it was a terrible service to draw on, all my early comic books were drawn on newsprint paper. So, um, okay, let's take a break. <laughs> In a moment, the channel will begin a new exciting adventure.